Cashflow Diary Podcast, episode 168. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, and welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. I am your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you have decided to tune in today because guess what? We're going to talk about one of the most important skill sets on the planet, the one that's preventing you from taking all of the action, most importantly, achieving the goals that you know you want to hit. It's the thing you've been avoiding. It's the one that you know you should do. It's the thing you're trying to prevent. You're saying, no, no, no. I just want to be a real estate investor because I don't want to have to learn to sell anything. Well, guess what? You're going to have to. And I'm sorry, you probably don't like that, but that's not my problem. My challenge is to teach you and introduce you to the individuals who can help you with that skill set. And today's guest is absolutely one of said individual. You said, how can I sell anything that's high dollar? Well, guess what a real estate investment is? Very high dollar. You say, hey, I would love to be able to take down really, really large business to business clients. Well, guess what today's guest is going to be able to do? Help you understand how he has been able to train so many companies to do that very thing. Today's guest is none other than John Clemson. He's an author, speaker, coach, and he has been teaching a trademark process called Moving Conversations Forward for over 20 years. That's code for This Isn't His First Rodeo. He's authored seven books and three business books, one of which has been translated into Russian. I'm sure that absolutely was a process that he probably enjoyed to a very immense degree. And he's also has three novels and a collection of short stories. He is truly what he calls the whole brain thinker. And I'm almost willing to bet that you're going to have to become one of those two in order to make these things happen. He's worked for tech companies and recruiting firms and hospitality, commercial real estate, banking as well. Here's the thing. Sales is a necessary skill. And today's guest is an expert. So we're going to learn from John Clemson. John, you there? I'm right here, Jay. How are you? Um, fantastic. I'm living the life, brother. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So I- I'm going to ask you a very similar question that I tend to ask most people. I-, I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs, of which you are clearly one, like a lot of like yesterday's superheroes. You know, yesterday's superheroes, we call them, you know, The Flash or Batman or Robin and Wonder Woman and all of these things that we've got going on today. They get dressed up, and then they fly around or swim or whatever and use special tools occasionally to save people from their own messes. That's literally Mm. what they do. And I look at entrepreneurs as doing the exact same thing. We have an idea. Mm. Occasionally we get dressed up, and we go and let the world (laughs) know (laughs) that we've got something special for them that can improve their life. However, they can never get it until we sell them something. However... Mm. What I want to know is before you were the author, speaker, and coach that you are, and you had your own trademark process, I want to know who John Clemson is. Well, first and foremost, I'm a husband and a father. I am uh, a man of deep faith. I am someone uh, for who family is um, of great import and not because it's a brand and not because I thump my chest, but because the relationships that we have within our own family prepare us to do battle, to jump off the building and be able to fly around (laughs) in that power suit uh, because we know that we've got someone, something, some entity, some support system to go back to that does not judge us based on whether or not we accomplished something today. 
You know, I, I like that. So before we leap off a tall building, uh, we should mm. <laughs> have something worth leaping off for. Uh, and more importantly, coming back home, too. I, I definitely mm. uh, I get that. So, uh, again, like most superheroes, we have an origin story. Before you get started, you know, saving people and flying around the world and doing those types of things, what on earth inspired you to actually say, you know what, I know, I, I can help people with sales, well, uh, I think the, using the word inspire is, uh, is very, very accurate. I'm an absolute fanatic for language. Um, that's why I became a writer. It is, um, it, it, I live and breathe language. And what inspired me to help other people was that I started in selling many, many years ago, and I was put at a desk with a phone and something that not a lot of people around anymore understand what, it's called, what, it, what it was good for. It was called a phone book. I don't know if you're old enough to remember those, Jay. It was a big old book that had names and phone numbers in it. There was no internet. There was no computer on your desk. Yes, I've been doing this since the dawn of time, and we just barely had electricity back then. But I was given a phone, a phone book, and I was told, get some deals. And I actually said to the manager, well, I'm going to need a pen and paper. And they said, a stationary store is right down the street. Knock yourself out. Not, oh, go get it, and we will repay your expenses. It was sink or swim. If you think you can sell, show us. And when you do show us, you will be allowed into this fraternity that there is no ritual outside of production for you to make. So, yeah, yeah, it was sink or swim. And it was, you know, it was not the uh, you get a trophy for showing up kind of environment. It was if you don't close a deal this month, you're going to have to leave. And what inspired me to help other people was that where my desk was situated in that office, was right next to a desk that the next new person went to. And I watched over the course of six months, a whole parade of people sit at that desk, stare at that desk, stare at that phone, stare out the window, and then all of a sudden be asked to leave. So I realized that I didn't want to get to know people that were going to probably leave because they couldn't figure it out. And I was fortunate enough to sit right in front of someone who was very, very good at selling. And I would listen to him and I would turn around in between his multiple phone calls throughout the day and say, how exactly did you do that? How did you come up with that? How did you get them to pay you more? And the guy was kind enough to answer my questions. Never forget him. My first mentor in sales name is Don DeFeo. If he's out there and if he's still in New York and if he's still placing people in, in, uh, in jobs in Manhattan, I wouldn't be surprised all these years later. He was a monster, but he wasn't the kind of monster that we imagine, which is, you know, running around, jumping up and down, yelling, screaming. This guy, Jay, would sit on the phone for two, three, and four minutes. And all I would hear out of his mouth was, okay, uh-huh. Yeah, that makes sense. What do you think we should do next? And, and it was almost like a broken record. But the thing was, is that he did it again and again and again. And there would be long periods of silence in between when he would deliver that. Uh-huh. Okay. Makes perfect sense. Because he sat there and listened to what his prospects and his customers were telling him. So I started doing that more. And I started asking questions like, what do you think we should do next? <laughs> And amazing how people always have an opinion as to what should happen next. And the beautiful thing is, is that if the opinion comes from them, it's not an opinion. It's a fact. So I just started saying to people next to me, listen, you know, I've been listening to Don and he's the top producer in the office. I'm not trying to tell you how to do what you do, but if you'd like, I can help you out. So you can kind of make a placement. You can earn some commission. And one person did it. Stayed there for a while. Someone went to the desk behind Don. They started asking me questions because they saw me helping that person. Other people came on board. They started asking me questions. And one day my boss comes to me and says, have you ever thought about doing training? And because I have a sales mentality, my first response was, how much does it pay? Nice. <laughs> no, but I can think about it right now. In fact, how many zeros is that? Yes. Uh, that's exactly. Right. I'll do the math in my head because understanding that I could move from, you know, uh, 100% at risk income to some percentage of at risk income with a base salary was like, you know, I'm a young, uh, newly married guy who dragged a uh, California blonde nurse across the country to New York with uh, the dream and the wish of a better life. I needed to produce. I whoa, needed to get whoa, some whoa, stuff whoa, done. Whoa. Hold on, hold on. Now, I hope everybody's listening because this tells you how good of a salesperson he is. 
<laughs> if you've ever lived in California and ever have even thought about the weather in New York, how do you on earth get anybody to move from California all the way to New York and voluntarily in, go through snow? That mm. is a am- you were good. You were good. I like it. I like it. Because <laughs> well, I'm telling you, that was a sales job right there. It absolutely was. And and here we are uh, knocking on the door of 31 years later and still married. Now, we, full disclosure, we live in Santa Monica, California now. Ah, gotcha. So it was it was a long, it was a lease agreement. It's like, hey, we're gonna go there for a while, but we're coming back. I got it. I don't blame yep. you though. But now you see what I mean. If how do if you've got anybody to leave here to go there, that's impressive to me. Thank um, you. <laughs> now, I, I there are so many things that you're saying right now, and I really want those in the 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 entrepreneurial space those you're trying to build your cash flow guys and i get that and i know you you feel like you got to kill and you got to eat and all these other things but you you glanced over something really really quickly that i've got to bring up i know when i was first getting started one of the things i thought i had to do was to more or less change who i was in order to be this personified salesperson quote unquote but mm-hmm. you you hinted at the idea that your this the the superstar sales mentor that you had, that's not really what he was doing. He was, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. Uh, he, he he was not there to tell people what he thought they should do. He was not future. Uh, I'm sorry, feature puking. He was not. Let me tell you. <laughs> let me tell you because I think it's a great idea. So you must think it's a great idea. The ability to not only tolerate but embrace. And embody silence is probably one of the most useful skills any salesperson, entrepreneur, company, person that's building an organization, probably the most useful skill that they can acquire and continue to develop over time. Because simple rule of thumb, I call it a painful selling truth, is the more I listen to what you say, the more fascinating you find me. Yes, Oh, I hope. Okay, guys, I know you're probably if you're washing the dishes. Maybe you're on the treadmill. I don't know, but I hope you heard what he just said. And if and if you're now just tuning into my voice, going, "What happened? What did I miss?" You need to rewind and hear that again, <laughs> because I, I I am constantly telling individuals when we're going. So you know, when we're out there, we're always in a selling situation. Nearly every conversation is, and what it comes down to is. People are always asking me, Jay, what do I got to do to get the, the person to accept these terms? Or how can I raise another hundred grand? Or what can I do to, to, to get the investors to say yes so that my deal gets done? And I'm always uh, finding, trying to find a new way to tell people to shut up and listen. <laughs> mm. it, it, it's, it's as simple as that, but it, it is, it, it, it's the, uh, the dichotomy of it's simple, but it's not easy. There are so many things that are basic and fundamental to what you and I do. Jay, as mentors, as leaders, as teachers, there are so many things that are fundamental that the second that we discard those fundamentals, we will no longer be able to hold the attention of our audience. So what we want is your audience to understand, the people listening to this podcast, we want them to understand that you do not have to say all these great things to get people to do things. And it's not about getting people to do things. It's about going out and finding out who's interested in doing these things, like investing in your portfolio or helping you raise money or whatever it is. You, you said before, you know, and you said almost kind of offhandedly that most conversations are sales conversations. Buddy, every conversation right. is a sales conversation because either you are looking to influence, persuade, guide someone to the future forward next step, or they are doing that with you. So my definition of selling, because again, I said, I'm I'm a fanatic for language. Why? Because to me, language is the great grand symphony of life. You and I will continually work to rephrase and to reword some specific salient point so that when it lands on the ears and in the mind and sinks down into the heart of the listener, it resonates there. Because when you and I create resonance with someone, they remember the experience. And guess what? They want to repeat the experience. Now, you're in Orange County, California, right? 
Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. I'm okay. sorry. I'm too so, busy listening right now. Go ahead. All right, that's okay. <laughs> so there's a, there's a brilliant entrepreneur who, who planted his flag in Orange County who had this great phrase. Now, before he passed away, he was asked, what do you attribute your great success to? And he said, do what you do so well that when people see what it is that you do, they will come back and see you do it again, and they'll bring others with them to see what it is that you do. And Walt Disney built an empire on that philosophy. Yeah, and he definitely has friend, people bringing friends back still. <sighs> it's amazing. I was at a, a conference in Cancun, Mexico. I'll never forget. It was in the travel industry. And one of the people from the hospitality division of Disney, which is massive, was up there talking about what it means to have a repeat customer. And they said any given day throughout all 365 calendar days of any year, when you walk into Disneyland, you are walking in with the fact that 70% of the people that are there that day have been there before. Wow. That's impressive. Talk about customer lifetime value. Oh, Ooh, my God. That, that's off the chain. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and it's barking and it's running down the street after your competitor. Oh, my goodness. You can't compete. I mean, to compete with that kind of, you know, re repeat business is, is tough, especially as a new guy coming into the market. That would be really, really, really tough. They can outspend you on marketing forever. Yeah. Ever. Anyway, oh, we, we're about to get sidetracked and go down a, a completely different dark hole Sorry. if, if Sorry. we don't get back. It's okay. It's okay. We, I, I, I have this feeling that you and I sit around thinking about these things, and then we get all excited about it, and everyone's around us going, what? Why? Don't – come on. Come up with something else. We get it. They're doing well. Yes, I get it. But we, we just enjoy what it is that we do. Now, it, it, I guess the, the question becomes, wh where did you get the, the – um, let me say, let me put it this way. Oftentimes it takes a special individual or a special set of courage to, it, it's one thing when you realize you've got a skill set yourself. It's another to be put into a position or your manager to say, hey, have you ever considered training? It's yeah. a whole different thing to say, you know what? I'm going to do this on my own. Where did, your, where did your courage come from? Um, embracing failure. I've been in did practice. Did you say embrace, embracing failure? Failure. Okay, I just want everybody to know I have not met him before uh, because you are saying, all right, I'm just excited. Uh, keep going. I got to hear how you're going to say that. I'm just like, he did not just say that. Yeah, go ahead. Look, I have learned more from my failures than I've learned from any of my successes because what my successes do is they puff me up, P-U-F-F, -F, puff me up. And guess what? That is not what builds long-term success. Humility is the absolute key ingredient to long-term success and the humility to say every single day, whatever it is that I have achieved, I hope that God gives me the strength to achieve something new today and to be useful today. Because I know you know uh, the world-famous who I call the, the king of all motivation, Zig Ziglar. Right. He said that yesterday is a canceled check, tomorrow is a promissory note, only now is negotiable. Right. So no matter what it is, you know, I'm standing here in my office and I'm looking at my, my, the books that I've published on my shelf and, you know, autographs that I've gotten from famous people. And guess what? They are aging by the moment. They are useful and they're great reminders. But you know what? It took a long time to get to those moments. So when I say embracing failure, dude, I, I started a training business and it lasted about seven weeks because I didn't understand this thing called, and I think you're familiar with it. It's called cash flow. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard of it. Yes. <laughs> mm. I had, I had two young mouths to feed plus the California blonde nurse plus a Volvo station wagon. And guess what? After about six weeks of no money coming in, um, you know, what was it? The Mark Victor Hansen, Hansen said, he said, if your, uh, uh, if your outgo exceeds your income, then your upkeep will be your downfall. Right. Yes, exactly. And I learned that very painful lesson after six weeks, and I was scrambling, and I said, I don't know what I was thinking. This was a bad idea. I'm never going to do this again. Please, God, give me another job, and I got another job, and I got that job, and I worked at that job, and I was dissatisfied with that job, but I felt a sense of obligation to my family and to society in general to march along with what a good friend of mine calls the paycheck herd. 
He said the paycheck <laughs> herd leaves the San Fernando Valley every day and drives down into Los Angeles to go to work. Or they leave Orange County every day and they go up into, uh, you know, uh, wherever, into uh, downtown to go to work. Um, the paycheck herd, while God bless them, it's the, it's the larger percentage of society. It's you and I and the people that listen to what you're doing that create new opportunities that give a place for those people in the paycheck herd to go to. So I was, I was um, downtrodden, and I was disappointed with myself, and I was angry. And it stayed with me for a while. And I tried it again. And I tried it with a partner that was better at spending money than he was at making money or being responsible for money. And was that his fault? No, that was my fault. Because I entered into a partnership that was not proper. I did not do the research. I did not vet that person. And I got caught up in the romance of I'm with this guy and we're going and golfing on a Wednesday morning and we're doing this and we're doing that. And we never made any money. <laughs> and I got into some serious trouble. Like they called me one day and said, Mr. Clinton, you're going to have to turn over the keys to your home and move your stuff out. Wow. I like it. Now, and my partner did not pay my mortgage. I had trouble paying the mortgage. I'm the one who got behind. I had to own that. Right. I like and it. to look at your bride and say, we got to go rent a smaller house and let go of this property that we thought we were going to raise the kids in was not a fun enterprise. Uh, no, no, not at all. Not at all, but you're speaking about something that I think is very important um, to understand. It. I think what it comes down to is, uh, you know, the concept of responsibility, whose job it is. I mean, even if if you are currently in a, a job, you you are working for an employer, your income it still isn't his or her responsibility. You know, it's it's really up to you, is what you're saying, and. Yep. At the end of the day, very few individuals are willing to take on that responsibility. But yet, that's the very thing, in my opinion, that makes uh, the United States and, and many freedom-loving countries great, is that the more responsibility you take, typically there are, you know, there's the other side of the coin of the more benefits you can actually take advantage of. And, and even our tax code is a reward system, if you look at it that way, for he or she who takes more responsibility tends to get more of the rewards. And, and and to me, Jay, the reward, it, it, what what drove me at the beginning when I started that business and I was uninformed, and then I started another business and I was I was putting my faith in someone else instead of myself. Um, it the 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 motivation for me, even today, sixteen years into a successful practice, the motivation was singular. It was specific. It was freedom. I want the freedom to serve who I choose to serve in the way I choose to serve them. I want the freedom to increase my fees over time. I want the freedom to work at 5 a.m. or not work at 1 p.m. It was all about freedom. So when I decided to do it the third time, notice I didn't say try it the third time. Right, because uh, I don't know if you're a fan of Star Wars or not. Yeah, I know where you're going, but Kel, yes, go for it. <laughs> Great Master Yoda, you know, said no, do or do not. There is no try. <laughs> exactly. Not a great impression, but it's the deepest I can go. Here's and and it's so brilliant. Do it or don't do it. Don't talk to me about trying. You know, when someone says to me, "I tried to call you," that's it. We're done. Don't don't BS me, dude. How do you try to call someone in today's society? I'm going to try to make it. And you know what? I'm not going to set up a place at my table for you because you're going to try to make it. I'm not going to have you draw all the attention of these other people to you because you had to show up seven minutes late. So everyone could understand that you're important to the rest of us. No, don't try. Do it or don't do it. So when I sat down with my wife on February 1st, 1999, when, oh, by the way, I had a job, which was a good job. It was a fun job. It was a reasonably well-paying job. And I said to her, I, I, I have to do this. Mm. I have to do this. This is not a, a hope, a wish, or a dream. This is a mission. This is a calling. I have to do this. And she looked at me and said, what if it doesn't work? And I said, then we will live in a car. <laughs> ah, 
you found the right woman, that's for sure. It goes, I, I, well, she I, well, was dead silent for 10 days after that. Yeah, well, <laughs> sure, 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 sure. I get, I, I, I totally get you there. My, my, I'm sure my wife has had more than one of those moments. Um, you know, I think of uh, the pursuit of happiness more than once when I think of our story mm-hmm. and all the things that we've, we've gone through. And I, I can only imagine what that must be like. But you, you, you speak about two things. One, uh, you said it really quickly, and I don't know if anybody caught that, is that you, you like to choose how you wish to serve people. You didn't say anything about selling anybody or twisting anyone's arm or forcing somebody to take something or even, and you've never, and I, I agree 100%, you, you never have yet to use the word convince. And I know all of those things are things that come out of, of the mouths of those who are learning and thinking that, you know, I've got to convince people to, to do something that they don't want to do. And it's, it's so not that. And uh, I know for me, it took a while before I learned the, the phrase that sales equals service. Once I got that concept down, um, I, I was off to the races. I was like, cool. So the only way I'm allowed to serve you is if I sell you something. We must have an equal exchange of value. Otherwise, the relationship becomes abusive in one way. So as soon as I understood that, I'm like, well, let's go, you know, and that that thought process that you just glanced over was actually the the pivotal point, at least for me to be able to go out there and confidently tell people, look, yes, you should pay this much. In fact, you should be paying more. But I'm just getting started, so here you go. <laughs> you know? Well, and 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 now here's the thing. Let, let's let, since I'm a fanatic for language, I don't want anybody to pay me anything, mm. and, and I'm not pl- trying to play a, a trick on words. I want them to invest. I want them to Agreed. to to move money toward that goal. You know, when when a company decides that they want to go from fifty salespeople to one hundred and fifty salespeople, and they bring me in. Now they didn't magically bring me in, and I don't have people standing on line outside my door, knocking on the door, saying, "Oh, coach, can you help us? Can you help us?" I bust my elderly rear end <laughs> to go out and find those opportunities. Right. I'm sixteen years in practice, published books, international work. Uh, yay, big friggin' deal. Yesterday's a canceled check. Right. <laughs> I, I know, right? <laughs> so I, we've got to go out and find the new things. But here's the thing. I don't want anybody to pay me. I want them to say, look, I want to invest in my people. So I'm going to invest in them by bringing you in. What's your fee? And when people ask me my fee and I deliver it to them and I say, how does that compare with what you expected? Instead of me delivering the fee and then talking for seven minutes to convince you that it's worth it, when someone says, what do you charge for a half day on site? And I tell them the number and I immediately follow it with, how does that compare with what you expected? About 30% of the time, people will say, that's a lot of money. And my response is, yes, it is. What would you like to do? Because here's the thing. I don't need your money. I need money, Jay. Oh, okay. I want more money. I don't need your money. You, I am not going to all of a sudden bend because, oh, well, we can't afford that. Well, guess what? That means you're not qualified. No offense. But here's the thing. When I want to take my wife to the Four Seasons Hotel and stay in a suite, I don't ask them if I can pay 160 bucks a night. Uh, I'm, I'm stunned silent because I'm trying to figure out how to – men to can grow up in completely separate ways but yet have very i mean you you sound like me <laughs> this is well, awesome. when i grow up i want to be like you brother uh, I, don't, you. I don't know about that i don't i i, I just know that i'm just like yes i i mean yeah, all, all of these things. I, I'm loving the phrasing. I'm loving the questions. I hope that if you are listening to this right now, you're doing what I'm doing. My notebook over here, as you guys know, I study questions. That's what I love to study. I, I, I purposely, here's what I do, John. I will go to the car dealership knowing that I have no intent to buy a car for the specific purpose of studying their sales process and their questions that they're going to ask me so that I can go, yeah, that one's good. I can use that one later. And I like collecting these questions and these phrases. And I, I'm just, you know, I just want you to keep talking so I can just keep writing down. I'm like, that's a good one. I can use that one too. Because all of these, when used in the proper sequence, can create, quote unquote, the the relationships. There's no such thing as a sales close. You're opening up a new relationship, new new possibilities. These are the things that prevent people. Let me ask you this question. Many people resist this this skill set. 
uh, for for uh, you know they just resist it and and I can't blame them to some degree. I mean, you know, you grow up. And mom says don't talk to strangers, and now you have a career where your job is to <laughs> talk to strangers all day long. That's good. I like that. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth, right? It is the truth. But but what what is it that you think? I guess gets in the way of people wanting to actually learn this skill set, even though you and I both have seen firsthand how this one skill set sets everything in motion. Okay, now I know some of you already know the skill set that we're going to be talking about here later in the show, and that's great. It's wonderful. Just want to make sure two things. One, that many of you out there, occasionally you send in an email from time to time, you've got some specific needs, some some help that you want, here's what we're doing. Go over to cashflowdiary.com forward slash ready. Cashflowdiary.com forward slash R-E-D-Y. And you can reserve a spot to actually speak with me directly if you'd like. Cashflowdiary.com forward slash ready. And as a reminder, we're still looking for more reviews. All you got to do is go ahead and leave a written review. Go into iTunes, leave a written review, and you'll be eligible to win a cash flow board game delivered to your door uh, for those who leave us a review. Well, here's the thing is that people think that selling is asking for something. People think that selling is uh, trying to persuade or convince or, or, or connive. Mm. And it is not. Uh, you said before that, you, you know, when you're closing, it's not some big close, you're opening something. My definition of closing is three words, coming to agreement. It. It's not coming to an agreement because when we insert that that participle, that means that it's my decision as to what the agreement should be. Now, I have a very clear path as to how someone goes from never hearing of me to hiring me to either consult with them to build their sales team or to come and speak at their, their sales meeting. Uh, it, it, it's a very clear process. However, you don't have to go through that process to please me. I can jump all over the chessboard at your invitation. See, say, people think that selling is about asking for permission. It's not. It's about engendering invitations because we would much rather go to an event that we're invited to than one that we are given permission to attend. So what I want to do is I want to, as you said, I want to ask questions so that I receive invitations to move the conversation forward. So you ask me, why do people resist going after sales? Well, because it, most people can tell when someone is trying to sell them something. All of us have that sixth sense. So guess what? I'm not going to play Wizard of Oz. And Wizard of Oz to me is pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. They say things like, I'm not trying to sell you anything. That is a lie. <laughs> so okay. I don't want to begin any relationships with a lie. Right. You know, my late father used to say, John, don't ever lie. This way, you never have to remember what you said. <laughs> right? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, people say to me, you said to me such and such. I say, yeah, that sounds like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That does sound like something I would say. Uh, yeah, it does. And it, I'm going to write it down because it, it sounds better coming from you than it did for me. Yeah, right. That's a good one. Let me write that. That's yes. a good one. I'm going to write that down. You know, I, I have this belief, and I'm just curious. Um, I, I actually believe fundamentally that people everyone yes you listening to my voice everybody actually likes selling it's not selling that they don't like <laughs> does that make sense it's pitching that they don't like right it's asking for money that they don't like so guess what let's explode that and let's get that out of the way in my book called how to sell without being a jerk we talk about moving conversations forward, not dragging, driving, forcing, or pushing, but moving conversations forward. And in my study of languages and language, I learned very early on that the power of that statement is that in, in the structure of language, moving conversations forward is referred to as what's called a, first, uh, a uh, present tense perfect. It's a present tense perfect because it starts with a verb and everybody understands what it means and where it's going the second that it's stated. So what we want to do, we in sales say, well, wait a minute, I don't want to shove something down anyone's throat. I want them to feel good about me, mm -hmm. the interchange mm -hmm. and where we're going together. I'm going to say that again. I want them to feel good about me, right. the interchange and where we are going together. 
So when I ask questions like, what do you think we should do next? Where would you like to see this go from here? What are your big, hairy, audacious goals? How does investing in this type of property help you achieve those? Notice I didn't say a single thing about what I want you to invest in. Now, of course, I'm going to have a portfolio. I'm going to be prepared. I'm going to have all of my data and ducks in a row. And I will say, here's what it, here's the opportunity. Here's what the minimum investment is. How does this look to you? Because it's not about me, nor is it about me closing. It's about me making a presentation of something that, as you said, is either going to be an exchange of value or not. Right. Yep. And the funny thing is to me is having learned, you know, levels and degrees of how to to be become masterful at this uh, art of conversation is what I'll call it in, in this particular sense. Um, it it makes other things so much more clear, so much easier to to degree because you know if an entrepreneur can actually sell, you have a shot at nearly any business. I mean, and you've obviously you've discovered this when you know you were working with companies like Rent dot com or American Express or what have you. The the point is. Why on earth do you think that – I'm just curious. Why, why, why not teach this to our high school students? Well, uh, I, I think that what's happening is that we, we're trying to get as much into their little uh, young little heads as possible. Um, I think that it is useful to bring it to high school students and under the specific pretext or within the context – of what interviewing skills are all about. Very few kids walking out of high school are going to, going to be entrepreneurs. Most of them are going to need to get some sort of job. And here's the thing, is that finding work, in my opinion, is one of the three essential life skills that nobody ever teaches us. Well, you have to be able to find work. Well, that, that in and of itself is a sales process. Oh, absolutely. What are the other two essential life skills? Well, uh, how to find work. Second is how to maintain relationships. You know, my parents were married 38 years when my father passed. And guess what? He never sat me down and said, here's how you're going to be able to get along with a, with a person who you've only known for two years and how you're going to make decisions about uh, money and where to send your kids to school and all that uh, stuff. <laughs> here's how you're going to settle arguments between the two of you. Never. Yeah. Right? Right. And then the third is how to communicate. We are taught how to speak in this country. We are not taught how to communicate. Oh, mm. yes. Go ahead. Now, I, 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 on that alone, I mean, I, I feel like driving up to Santa Monica and meeting you right now. Anyway, dude, uh, <laughs> dude, there's some it, great places for lunch here. <laughs> we are. There's just so much that's. There's so much that resonates between everything that you're saying and and how I've I've been communicating to people because I try to tell people and and share with them and impress upon them the importance that in order for your message to be heard it has to a be sent received and properly interpreted and until all three of those steps have been met you've said nothing well and here's a simple rule of thumb the third time you begin a sentence with the word i your listener mentally checks out Ooh, nice. I'm here today because I want to show you this investment opportunity, and I think that you should do this, and I have done the research, and I, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I bet you there's someone squirming right now in their car going, oh, my God, I just did that. <laughs> mm. We all do because we're, we're an eye-focused entity, right? We're convinced that we're the center of the universe. And the second whoa, that we whoa, can whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm, Hold on. What do you mean? I'm not? I thought I it. What do you mean? I'm well, not dude, you. Come on. I don't. I haven't met your wife, so I can't. I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Good point. Good point. All right. All right. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You were saying most humans are <laughs> are convinced that they are the center of the universe, and it is in point of fact because they are constantly inside their own head. They are constantly responding to what it is they want as opposed to what it is that they have. And we are, from the second we get out of bed, we're making that comparison. So I said earlier, I want the freedom to choose whom I will serve. When my feet hit the floor, the first thing I think of is not, here's what I want and, and here's the gap between what I want and what I have. My first thought is, who do I get to serve 
today. Yeah. Now I'm excited. The, why is that such? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So here's uh, I uh, why. Mm, see, when I get Spit excited, out, Jay, when I get excited, I stutter. <laughs> That's the problem. It's like <laughs> you get. It's like I can't even get the words out. So what? I find it interesting because I that's this that same question gets me excited. Anytime I've been on stage, no matter who I'm on stage with, no matter where I'm on stage, no matter whom I'm helping, no matter who's coming into the database, I, I look at the names and I go, oh, we're going to get to serve them. And when they do, and I start dreaming of all the things that we could help them with and how their life is going to be different. And I just find it interesting. I, I care a lot more uh, about just who do I get to serve? Who's going to let me serve them today? Okay, so... I'm sure you have another question because otherwise I'll just keep talking. It, no, no, no. That I just was curious as to you use the same language that I use in terms of we we're using the same language in terms of the serve. And I'm kind of curious where you got that from. Uh, well, as I said to you earlier, I'm a, I'm a man of deep faith. And uh, the more I read uh, the uh, literature of my faith, the more I'm reminded how important service is because um, I believe that we will never be so fulfilled as we are when we pour ourselves out into someone else. Yeah. We're not here to, to consume. We're not here to collect. We are here to serve, to give, to, you know, and to, to make someone else's life better. And look, you know, I, I live in a nice area, in a nice neighborhood in that area. I mean, I can see the Santa Monica Bay from my office. Life is good, but you know what? It hasn't been like this forever. It took a long time. It took a lot of late nights, early mornings, and what uh, a former pastor of mine used to refer to as dark nights of the soul. Yeah. Am I really doing the right thing? Is there something else I should be doing? Is there an easier way out? I, I, oh, mm, yes. So l- let me ask you this question because I, I know I can answer it. So how many times have you mentally quit and had to restart? <laughs> what time is it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? It, it, it's like, oh, I'm not going to do this anymore. And then you you figure out those reasons why you must do this. And And I know it sounds crazy to some people but i feel very mission driven myself and and i think that mission is is absolutely the reason i mean there's no other reason to keep subjecting yourself to quote unquote all of the pain except for the mission so why go on this mission to help you know corporations or or individuals you know sell high ticket items etc why why does the mission mean so much to you well because i have to answer a question every day and it's a question that uh, inspired me that came from Thomas Edison. And uh, he, he, I'll tell you what he said, and then I'll tell you the question I ask myself every day. He said, if we did what we were actually capable of, we would astound ourselves. So the question is, what am I really capable of? Wow. I'm going to be 56 years old. And I got to tell you, man, I feel like I have the strength of 10 men. I feel like I have not even started. I feel like there is a universe of humans and organizations for me to serve that haven't even shown up on my radar yet. And here's the great thing, is that we're constantly looking for someone else to inspire us. Now, I just met at an event a week ago, a gentleman who is knocking on the door of his 82nd birthday, who works five days a week and is in the midst of helping build a startup. This is the true definition of an optimist. Nice. Yes, I love it. Well, and that's the thing. When you find, I know for me, it took a long time to figure out what my gifts, talents, wherever they lie, Mm -hmm. and how to let the genius come out. and, And once you find it, you never want to not do it i know for so i'll ask you this question because i know for a couple of years ago myself we were probably at about 117 units or so and i said to myself okay we're retiring or whatever and i spent a summer and all i did was you know fly remote controlled helicopters and play with photography equipment and i got bored i'm like i need to do something and that's when the idea of helping other people hit me like this was the next step slash transition so i i ask you because i know for myself today it's settled but for you, do you ever see a time in your future where you will retire? Is the oh, way God, people I hope think? Not. 
<laughs> exactly. Right? Mm. No. Now, look, uh, one of my idols is a gentleman named M.C. Escher. And Escher uh, created impossible art. He literally, through his imagination, put things. I thought he put them on paper. What he did was he carved lithographs, and then he made prints from the lithographs. And the guy worked every day of the year except Christmas and his birthday. And he literally was working the day he died. Why? Because it's not, it's not labor. It is not a burden to be able to, to um, uh, embody our gifts. It is, you know, it, and here's the thing that your people need to hear, and, and I hope this doesn't scare the hell out of you. I hope none of the people that are, that are following your program are doing this for money. Oh, me too. I, 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 it's one of the first things that I tell them. I mean, when they, if, if they're experiencing many successive failures, I'm like, are you're, if you're not doing this to help the other person, help the person who has a problem. And that's because that's one of the fundamental concepts. People ask me, Hey, Jay, how can I find another property? I'm like, well, that's the problem. You're looking for a property. See, when people are looking for a property, they're trying to find a paycheck. But if you look for a problem and solve a person's problem, you're actually now trying to help a person. And that's a completely different conversation and you approach it differently uh, at the end of the day. So, uh, yeah. That, and, and I'm going to interrupt you. If you're not solving the problem, you should be creating an opportunity for someone else. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And these are the things that... Oh man, that I, I I get excited about as we go through the process of of transforming individuals. So this brings up a question because I want to I want to squash this once and for all because I, I know I had an, an excuse, and again, when we're afraid, any excuse will do. But uh, <laughs> are you are you of the mindset that? Um, sales, the, the, the skill set, uh, as you, as we're calling it, is that something that is you're born with? No, it's not exclusive to someone with shiny shoes and bright teeth and, and can speak quickly. <laughs> it is, uh, it is, it's a skill. And if it's a skill, it, that means it can be learned, uh, following logical progression of thought. If it, if it can be learned, then I can learn it. What it means is that I have to display some humility. I've been a musician since I was nine years old. I've played a variety of instruments. I've sang, I've written music, I've recorded music, all this stuff. Five weeks ago, I decided that I wanted to see whether or not I could play the guitar. Notice I didn't say try to play the guitar. I wanted to see whether or not I could. Well, after two weeks of study and an hour a day of practice, I learned, yes, I can learn to play the guitar. I can control my fingers. And because I understand the power of discipline, within the understanding the power of discipline, I have, I can absolutely have the patience for it, because my goal is a year from today to be able to play a song through without looking at my fingers, without looking at the music. Now, every one of my musician friends says, yeah, you're probably going to want to adjust that down. It's probably going to be a lot sooner than a year. Good. You know what? If it occurs before a year, cool, because I'm prepared five days a week to play the guitar for one hour every day to invest the discipline, the patience, and the brain power. So it's about learning. Selling is a skill. Learning means you must embrace the fact that you don't know how to do it now. That doesn't mean that you cannot know how to do it six months from today. Yeah. The key, it, the key is sticking with it for that six-month period. Um, cause we get so many individuals who are trying to, you know, transact real estate and they're like, okay, I, I need to do it this weekend. I'm like, have you ever done it before? No. Well, it ain't going to happen this weekend. That's right. <laughs> the, one of the painful selling truths out of my book is, uh, if you want new business today, today is far too late for you to start working on it. <laughs> right. You, that was, that should have been started three, four, five, six months ago. Totally right. understood. So, so what, what is your future self? What is your, what is your compelling future that you want to create? Because if you, if you, I need to have things change immediately, it's not going to happen. I have a guy who, um, I was working on building a sales team with uh, a small startup company in New York. And, um, there were several factors that, 
indicated that it was not going to work. Doesn't matter what the factors are, it didn't work. So all of a sudden, next thing you know, he's without a place to go every day. And we're sitting at dinner and he says, I have to have a job by next week. I said, well, I hate to be the one to tell you the truth, brother, but you ain't going to. Right. There's no way you're going to get a job in a week. Right. Took him five weeks. And he's got an amazing opportunity. Not only is it a job, he's got, um, uh, what do you call it, equity. Oh, nice. Yeah. Why? Because we said, let's figure out where you really want to be. And then let's figure out how quickly it's going to happen because you don't have that kind of control. Right, right. So what do you want six months from today? Write it down. Write it out in your own hand every single day on a new piece of paper. And teach your subconscious what the power of will is. Indeed. Indeed. Now you've mentioned a number of your books. What would you say is your most popular one? It's called the ultimate sales manager's guide. It has been adopted uh, across the country and internationally. And it is about if you are going to build an organization, you're going to need to build a sales team. And that is a skill that no one is born with. And that a very small percentage of humans, even want to imagine when I go and I get in front of a bunch of sales managers, I say the first thing out of my mouth is who in their right mind would want to get up every day and go to work and manage salespeople. <laughs> and, and use the key word is right mind. That's uh, exactly right. right. Because salespeople are psychotic uh, and so are entrepreneurs. Why? Because we think that the world will be different because of what it is that we do. Well, you know what? You can call it psychotic. You can call it visionary. We'll go with visionary today. I like it. So the, the Sales Manager's Guide is, the, is by far the most popular. It outsells my other two books by a margin of four to one. Nice, nice. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I know those listening have enjoyed it. I mean, especially if, they, if we didn't scare them off from the intro and start <laughs> saying sales. I mean, we, we, it's like we were cursing to some people. Every time we said the word sales, he's like, ah, stop it. You know, uh, if, if we didn't scare them off, how can they go find more about what you are up to? All they have to do is Google my last name. Uh, they may come across some son, some stuff that shows my son, the filmmaker, um, because we have the same last name. But the easiest thing to do is, number one, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, the second easiest is to go to my website. And the third is to go to Amazon and type in my last name under books. And I'll spell it for you clearly and simply. It uh, Once you see it written out, it's not so scary. It's K-L-Y, M like Mary, S like Sam, H Y. And like Nancy, if you go to www.klimshin.com, if you Google Klimshin, if you go on uh, LinkedIn and you look up Klimshin, you'll find me. Um, I'm guessing uh, if we find anyone named Klimshin, they're related to you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I I like when I check into a hotel and I spell the last name and they say, are you John? And I say, do you have another Klimshin staying here? (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) Because I want to meet them. Exactly. Exactly. That's, That's impressive. So... If you right now were to pretend for a second, you're talking to that would-be entrepreneur, that new person who's ready to, to tackle sales, that person who's looking for their next big paycheck even, uh, maybe they're, they're ready to put on their superhero outfit for the first time, but feeling a little trepidation. Maybe all they've known is the, the, the quote-unquote perceived security of a job. What would you say to them at this moment? couple of things. Number one, uh, figure out what a reasonable goal is and don't pull it out of the depths of your head all by yourself. Speak to someone like Jay. Speak to a mentor. Speak to someone who has gone down a similar path and say, I'm setting a goal for six months for t- from today to achieve this. Is this reasonable in your perception? in your world. And if they get a yes, great. If they get a no, okay, what should, what would a reasonable goal be? Now, you know that the, the, our reach must exceed our grasp. So to say, well, I'm going to walk around the block once a day, not that impressive. To say, I'm going to walk five miles a day for the next five weeks every day, that's impressive. Why? Because it's discipline oriented. And the power of discipline is that it will remove all distractions. So the first thing is set a goal, What do you want to achieve six months from today and ensure and test it and have it evaluated by someone who knows what they're talking about to see if it is realistic? Second, become a learner, not a student, a learner. What does a student do? Learns all the answers for the test, wants to get the test out of the way, does not retain the knowledge. 
become a learner. And I want you to buy two books. One is mine. One is not. The book I want you to buy if you're going to become an entrepreneur is How to Sell Without Being a Jerk, because that's what everybody wants to know. Right. The second is the single greatest piece of literature ever written on the subject, and it is available at every Barnes & Noble in the country and on Amazon.com, and it's all of a $7.99 investment. The book is called The Greatest Salesman in the World. There is a percentage of people that read that book and say, yeah, that was a good book. And there's a very small percentage of people that do and use the book the way it instructs them to use it, which means that it stays with them daily for six months. I will tell you, Jay, in my experience in selling, selling what it is that I do, helping other people sell what they do, helping people go from 22 salespeople to 500 salespeople in seven years, that All of the things that need to be done, the single most important thing is to act, do some specific activity again and again and again so that it is habit, so that it is refined, so that the world and the world cannot resist your will. So the greatest salesman in the world says you need to do these specific actions. Don't finish the book and put it on your shelf. And that small percentage of people, every single person I've met for over 25 years that has done that exact thing has exploded their influence, their ability to serve, and oh, by the way, their income. Yep. Completely understood. Love it. Well, I definitely appreciate you taking the time to invest here. It's been a pleasure, man. I live to serve. (laughs) Excellent, excellent. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What are you going to do today? Well, here's what's going to happen. You're going to do something. Go over to Clemson.com. Again, that's K-L-Y-M-S-H-Y-N.com. Get started. Move in the direction. Take measurable action towards any one of the goals that you came up with. And I know you came up with at least one while listening to us. You said to yourself, ooh, I should do that. Ooh, that sounds good too. Well, I want you to put that on a piece of paper that you're going to get it done within the next 24 to 48 hours and move in that direction. Make it happen. Because guess what? You know what I believe? I believe that you can indeed do it. It's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.